super fans and welcome to No Small Questions, a Q&A show with the cast of No Small Roles. You may have noticed that your regular QM is absent. We are absolutely gutted that the amazing superfan Sam couldn't be here to host, but I, superfan Hannah, have stepped up to the plate to grill this month's incredible cast members and wheedle out all their secrets. Oh my god. So, <laughs> grill. Some <laughs> nice, interesting hey. words there. It's terrifying, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be nice, I oh promise. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Some are born magic, some achieve magic, and some have magic thrust upon them. And we have resplendent examples of the first and last with us tonight. Yes, this month I will be questioning the tea-obsessed sorcerer who can't help but get inside your head, the glorious Vicky Gaskin who plays Juna Septhorn. Hey! And that was like, hey, and hello, and hi at the same time. Sorry, I'm too excited. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'll also be questioning the big-hearted warlock with a penchant for inscrutable <laughs> mimes, the delightful Daryl Bailey, who plays Enki Dukai. Oh, hello, teapots. <laughs> hello, Darryl. tea bags. Hello, teacups. <laughs> <laughs> so, shall we dive right in with our first question? Absolutely. How are you guys doing? Obviously, quite excited. I'm, I'm assuming. I'm yeah. incredibly <laughs> nervous. Um, I'm gonna say the wrong thing, and yeah, <laughs> cycle of strings. It didn't didn't happen. Just I didn't say, say retcon, Daryl, and, and it all goes away. <laughs> There's no. <laughs> I'd say retcon. <laughs> Absolutely. There's no wrong thing when you've got we retcon. Should, in we your should pocket. homebrew the retcon mm -hmm. spell. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So this is for both of you. And Mike C asks, if you could take control of one of the other characters for a session, who would it be and why? I think I'd choose Gaius because then I could find out all his secrets, <laughs> find out what's going on. I, was, I think it would be really fun as well. Gaius. Yeah. I think I'd maybe choose Juna. What does the world look like when you can interact with it in such a unique way? Do you know what I mean? The flower checks, <laughs> not so much the mind reading. <laughs> the mind reading is fun, um, but like being able to talk to animals. Do you know what I mean? Like how? What are the avenues of like interacting with the world? Just open up with like yes, the ability to speak telepathically and read minds, and also speaking to animals as well. And the flower checks is 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 really fascinating. So yeah, I I, I choose Juno. I might change my answer to Enkidu. I was suddenly like actually, it'd be really cool to be Enkidu. <laughs> like. To sort of, yeah, do the inside checks and like get to know those guys and sort of see them in my mind's eye if I was in Kidu. I changed my answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting that both of you still chose to continue with uh, magic users. Hmm. Um, it I'm really so sorry, yeah. Retcon. I didn't hear that. I'm really sorry, Hannah. What did you say? <laughs> <Not a retcon>. <laughs> 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 I was just saying it's really interesting that both of you decided to stick with magic users so there's no sort of switching uh, over yeah. class yeah. in terms of well, I I didn't even think about it from like a gameplay perspective if it was like purely for like okay you're gonna go into a fight and you can switch characters I'd, I'd probably wouldn't choose Juna I'd choose someone else but like I kind of went at it from like a story exploration aspect is that similar for you Vicky yeah, I think like there's there's something that Juna and, and Enki do share, isn't there? So I think it's like th there's a reason we're playing the characters we're playing. So there's a reason like a sort of crossover, isn't there? Of like the sort of they're quite big picture thinkers and yeah, like a bit a bit of a left field magic user. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like that. Totally. <laughs> And both of you seem to have um, an affinity for animals as well. Yeah. I, in real life, I'm not like a massively animal person. I'm not like, I I don't have, I've never had any pets. I had like goldfish and hamsters when I was a kid, but I've never really like done like the whole pet thing. I quite like playing animals, but yeah, it's interesting that how much Juna loves animals. Like I respect all animals, but I'm not like a, like a crazy animal person in real life. Yeah. Just interesting. I, yeah. I think the one the interesting thing I find about Juna is how she treats animals as people. There isn't that dis massive distinction from my perspective of how Juna approaches and speaks to a humanoid versus 
a squirrel or a crow. She will uh, she will ask a crow an open question like, "What's going on?" Whereas Daryl <laughs> is laughing his head off, like, "How the fuck is a crow supposed to know <laughs> what evil sorcery is going to go on in the woods?" But like, she will go in like full full on and like ask those questions, which I really like. Um, <laughs> and Kidu, I didn't. I I have never decided made that decision beforehand whether or not he liked animals or not. I think it's just a a treatment of um just the respect for life in general oh that's lovely but it is it is interesting how enkidu seem to be so affected by the animal deaths in in a way that he wasn't necessarily as affected by the deaths of the vondels for example um are you asking me to comment on that <laughs> You're so suspicious Cause it, of me because there's a lack of like. There's no question at the end. Of, there's no question. It's like, 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 um, not blanket, but like, there's a statement there, and I'm like, do I respond to that or do I just? <laughs> you can respond yes. if you want. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, oh, it's a morality thing with the Vondells. It was like these people are evil. They've abused their power. Akido doesn't like it when people in the position of power abuse that responsibility or neglect that respons- responsibility abuse that power to the detriment of those they're supposed to be um supposed to be protecting and serving and that doesn't sit right with him and he takes action and um if i remember correctly um after there's a that big scene where everyone kind of like has to wrestle with what they've done under the, in the bunker and the cutie says they had a choice and they made that choice whereas with the animals that is uh, I don't want to say it's a past trauma, but it's something he's seen done to someone else close to him where a person he is close to, I think I've revealed a little bit about this person's backstory, has had been a victim of abuse by a certain group of people and they didn't really get a choice or have any power to break free of that predicament. And Akudu was involved in like setting this person free and sticking close to them. So seeing that so early on in his life, sticks with him and then on his journey with Gilgamesh the whole journey to becoming a king and what that means to have power and responsibility and protect um the underprivileged and the weak is kind of like kind of creating this kind of moral complex for Enkidu as he journeys on and it's kind of um being reinforced in the current arc that they're in with uh, with the ring thrups yeah the wing thrups at least listening to i found so difficult to grapple with in terms of the morality behind it in terms of like what they're actually providing for people but also it's so sinister and evil in so many ways Mm. Um, yeah which is so tricky on a slightly different note i have a question for you vicky from tiamat danger blade um so they ask i'm curious with the seven are the full set born in the same generation and if one dies is someone born to replace them Ooh. I, like, Juno, I don't think knows any of this, but sort of in my head, I feel like they're loosely in the same generation. So, I mean, D- like, David kind of has control of this now, but in my head, it feels like they're not, like, all born, on the, like, at the same moment on the same day, but it's almost like a sort of, like, a snake skin, I guess. Like, eventually, there's, like, a new seven that appear around about the sort of the same time. So that's what I imagine. And are all of them, are all of them gnomes? Yeah. Again, David David sort of has control of it. But when I was like imagining it, yeah, they were all gnomes and they would all, yeah, all be like around about the same age. And I I didn't think about if like, in my head, I guess it was just if one of them died, that part of the balance was missing. But I guess like it kind of could be either way. I don't know. I sort of, yeah, like the the idea that June had kind of only really knows kind of folklore about it meant that I could be a bit like mysterious with it Mm. (laughs) I I also quite like like I have this sort of I quite like being out of control like I quite like you know like falling from heights and roller coasters and stuff and there's something about like the danger of not quite knowing that myself that I really kind of love and like the yeah like what David could do with that like loose end I mean I, I know like I'm always like oh David but I quite like that yeah that sort of really like that dangerous like what's he gonna what is he gonna do with the like the crumbs that I've given him and it's all gonna come back at some point but I quite like that it could be a complete and utter chaotic nightmare that's not an invitation though David (laughs) (laughs) that 
is one of the really exciting things about D&D though, isn't it? It is truly collaborative in that sense in that you can hand over something to someone and it can come back at any point in a form that you don't fully recognise yeah. and you just have to respond to it, go with it and see what happens. Yeah. And I feel like at, at some point, one of these flower checks is going to have to like come back. Like, I don't know, like that, that there is, you know, maybe someone else or, you know, that she sort of comes into contact with them and then sort of how, yeah, like what that makes her think and, and where Juna feels like she is in this sort of balance of seven. But I kind of, yeah, I like the chaos of it and the like not knowing. <laughs> Even though it's terrifying. <laughs> well, speaking of unknowns and taking an idea and then letting people kind of mess with it a little bit. Daryl, I have a question for you from superfan Sam. Yeah. That, well, it's kind of two questions in one. <laughs> Classic Sam. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Sam. <laughs> we so do, we do. He has asked, have you considered running a one-shot called Inkidu, <gasps> where your patrons become player characters who have to work together to defeat Enkidu's greatest fears and darkest memories? Also, if you had to cast the other rollers as your patrons, <gasps> who would you choose to play each character? Oh, That's a great question. That's an incredible yeah. question. A great concept as well. Good one. Um, I want to play. <laughs> yeah, good one. I have thought about uh, just musing, never, never 100% serious about a Enkidu one shot with all of his friends but never for that um, idea to fight all the monsters inside so that's kind of answering the first bit of that question as to who would play what I think Gilgamesh would go to David Hina would go to Grace Light would go to Ben and Cal for Vicky and I think that's purely from like mainly like a character personality thing just you know matching personalities to to which and what about Alcibiades Alcibiades um <laughs> would he would he be part of the party or would he be an enemy oh Chris of course what am I talking about I've left Chris out how did I do that oh gosh <laughs> oh sorry Chris uh, Chris would have to be Alcibiades then um and that actually fits because they're both as mysterious as each other because I know nothing about Gaius because everything he says is a lie and <laughs> <laughs> and Asabiades I'm learning much about him considering Enkidu and Asabiades have been connected for so many years he um Enkidu knows not a lot about him so yeah Chris would have to play Asabiades yeah that, I, I'm sticking to that he is really really good at being mysterious mm. yeah it's really interesting to hear it from the cast members as well, because obviously the super fans are like, what are his secrets? <laughs> what are they? I don't know. I think it's going to come out at a really it inconvenient has to time. At some point. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be at a really inconvenient time as well, because unlike Gaius, um, Alcibiades is not a liar, and they get the impression that he's loyal to something or someone that Enkidu was never privy to. So. It's a deep, deep secret, I'm thinking. There's something nice about Chris playing Alcibiades because he is like the loveliest, which makes me think he would make yeah. an amazing baddie. Yeah. That is always the way, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We Well, I had a similar theory about like the loveliest people playing the best baddies. Did you say that on Superfan Chats? I feel like I've literally think, stolen that so, out yeah. of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great, it was a great point. Have, I, said yeah. It. Yeah. I think you have. I, that, I've literally stolen that from you and now saying it back to I you. Completely, I, I completely agree with you, Vicky. <laughs> I do think the loveliest people yeah. are able to play the best baddies and I'm not quite sure why yet, but it definitely is a trend. Yeah, for sure. I'm obviously very on board with that as I'm copying mm -hmm. you already. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Superfan Sam also has a question for you, which is, uh, I absolutely love the imagery of Juna completely covered with body art, but which of those tattoos was her first and what was the story behind it? Uh, the first other than the mark that she was born with, right? Because that, mm -hmm. that was sort yeah. of the first one. What was the second part of the question? So which of the tattoos was the first and what was the story behind it? I think the first one would probably be a tattoo to do with her birth family, I guess, because whilst her like true family is Ginger and is sort of all, all she's really known, she was sort of taken away from her family instantly. She does have like almost like a like a long lost family connection or like a a loose connection. There's no they're not like strangers. They're not a mystery. She doesn't have much to do with them. So 
I imagine that like when she was sort of adolescent, that that was the sort of start of obviously the idea was to hide, hide the mark amongst other marks and to start that kind of where it began, I think was, it would be the first sort of story of like her siblings and her parents and their forest gnomes. So like, I imagine it with like leaves round it and sort of trees, that kind of stuff. And there'd de- there'd definitely be like something to symbolise Ginger because she's obviously been a really part of, of uh, Juna's life. Yeah, and then yeah, just sort of this like patchwork of the diff the different parts of her story. Does it feel like she would have got them chronologically then, sort of to represent like her life chronologically? Yeah. yeah. So when she sort of gets to a certain point, suddenly going, okay, this is a big enough part of my life that this is going to stay like on my skin. Maybe at some point she will have something to do with this story added to the collection. Just listening to you talk about it, I don't think I fully realised that Juna was taken away from her family almost immediately. I don't know if she shared that part of the story because I don't like, for Juna, it's not this massive trauma. Dropping the hot gossip. Um, Yeah, like I think for her, it was just, you know, this was her life that she sort of, if you're born with this mark, this is what happens to you, so... Yeah, there, yeah. There's all this. That I I have a very specific story of her relationship with her family and and particularly with her siblings and how like the sort of reason behind the, like Juna's backstory is like it's this idea of like being special and like having a gift, but at the same time, how much you have to give up. So it's like it's like a blessing and a curse kind of thing. Um, I think that's why she's sort of all about the balance. That it's this idea of like she she feels like she has this gift but at the same time she feels like she has this burden um so she's yeah so it's almost like it comes with a bit of a price so there's yeah well she yeah she's given up the life that she should have led but she doesn't like she doesn't know what that ever would have been because yeah literally she she was she was born she had the mark and she was sent to live with ginger who raised her from a baby so her parents kind of aren't her parents like like i would consider my actual parents because she was raised by someone else that's such a really that's such an interesting insight into Juna but also like how she just kind of rolls with it yeah that's just kind of who she is and she's like well this is what my life was so yeah that's all I've ever known yeah. so and very, and very it's like this sort of doctrine of like this is this is sort of what you have to do this is this is your destiny so you just have to do it and that it's um oh what's that film uh never let me go that they sort of they they have that that's all they ever know and so they just sort of accept it and I think for Juna she just that is just yeah like that's her life there's no like there's no alternative kind of thing and you know she's not had a bad life she's just had a different life she's so interesting (laughs) so derivative she's 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 lived so much life though there's so much going on Shall we hear from one of our audience members? Yes, please. You're with us in the Zoom tonight. Um, Pippa, I believe you are here and you have a question. Hey, gang. Hey, Hey, Pippa. Hello, nice to chat to you again. I've got questions for each of you, but I'll ask Daryl first, if that's all right. Of course. So since Enkidu realised that he has six whole years of his life unaccounted for, he's not really spoken about it to his companions or to his patrons. Is he keeping these concerns to himself or is he trying to block it out and just get on with the mission from Heron? Um, there is so much going on right now <laughs> that <laughs> um, I think he's scared as well. Like the last time he remembered not being in control of himself, he almost killed Juna. So for six years of potentially that as well, like I don't imagine, and Kidu imagines that he was asleep in a cave for six years he something happened he went somewhere he did something and (laughs) like right he can there there will be an opportunity to address that somehow and whatever happened there and how it happened will be important to getting his friends and Alcibiades out I think but right now he just (laughs) I don't think he can handle (laughs) coming to terms with what happened there so yeah can i ask a follow-up question to that please do you daryl have an idea of what happened in those six years or have you given that over to david i've completely given that over to david i have no idea what would have happened so what are you what what are your suspicions then like what are your 
your theories? Um, I suspect that there was some kind of like wrestling of control over the host body of Nginu, like between everyone. Some kind of conflict happened inside. Maybe Alcibiades won that conflict or there was some other force at work because the others haven't brought it up. <laughs> no one, absolutely no one's spoken about it. So I think whomever or whatever caused that thing to happen, like, I don't know. I just don't know. I'm I'm snowballing <laughs> here and it's going nowhere. But um I anything anything could have happened. Six years is a long time. <laughs> it's a long what time. What if Alcibiades won and really Enkidu is Alcibiades pretending to be Enkidu? Oh, that's an interesting theory. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting theory. And I've seen that somewhere before. Um <laughs> Grace has said maybe there's another inside voice that we I fully don't expect know. there is one and Enkidu believes that as well because he said um when the uh, when he came out with um, the whole backstory after um Asobades took over and tried to attack Juna Enkidu said there are at least five people inside at least because when the incident took place there was more there was a whole bunch of people there there was a big fight there could be <laughs> there could be a lot more inside for all he knows. Grace also says that he can have a horse in there. <laughs> that's Ben. Ben, ben said that. Ben, sorry, and he's hiding ben. away from the mic. He's pointing at Grace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's why he was so sympathetic to Bessie. <laughs> well, he's sympathetic to Bessie because he killed her. <laughs> but, oh. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, a truly heartbreaking moment. Yeah. yeah. That was so painful. Yeah, gosh. Pippa, you've got your second question. I do. Thank you, Daryl. I can't wait to find out what actually went on. Vicky. Hi, Vicky. Hey. My question for you is, with 200 years of potential backstory for Juna, I wondered how much of that time Juna had spent with the Rose family and whether she has any family of her own that she's not mentioned yet, any spouses or children, for example. Um, so obviously, yeah. We're, we're getting all of Juna's backstory tonight. She's got like I a... Know. She's got like her family she was born into so the timeline I think she's been my memory is terrible but it, it, I had planned it all out at one point I think the idea was that she'd been with the roses for about 50 years which is why she knows Gwen so well there is in her past like one romantic connection that is very much the idea that like the secret of who she really was and her destiny very much got in the way of that in that sort of yeah, that sort of vein. I feel like with with Juna, it's almost like anything could happen romantically. She could go the rest of her life with like no romantic links, or she could just one day like get a toy boy, or you know, uh, yeah, like being polyamorous. Relate, you know. I just think like it, like it's I, Vicky, don't really know like what Juna's she, what Juna's tastes are because it she was very quick to say that they were a wing thruple yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and Vern Rise oh we having an orgy oh I'm, I'm I'm not disappointed Gwen that we're not I just you know <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah Been she's there, got what's, one one sort of serious romantic sort of history moment that is very much sort of for her now this sort of the, the the secret that she carries has very much got in the way of that, and yeah, we'll we'll see if that ever comes back up, or or if that's gone, or yeah, what direction she'll go in. But yeah, it, it, does could... she have a tattoo about it? Yeah, she's got a tattoo for everything. Ah, oh. so yeah, <laughs> if someone oh like the next episode we record, someone's like, mm, "What's that tattoo that's surrounded in all the love hearts?" <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, everything is just there to see but but kind of coded so i haven't actually thought of what that tattoo would be i think it would be something like i imagine like maybe like an infinity symbol that's like got bits of it missing or something like it, she thought it was forever but it wasn't oh. sad times yeah oh that sounds kind of like amazing but also like a tiny bit sad yeah and a bit, there's like there's a little bit of bitterness there yeah a bit sad bit bitter but i think she's definitely like lived like more of a what's the word I'm looking for like not a promiscuous life but much more like being in a place like in Splinter Falls I think she probably like had a few dalliances around and about she's uh 
You got got fond memories of Splinter Falls and all, all the things that happened. That's what I couldn't tell because when you were about to answer the question, I was sort of checking to think like, oh, would Juna, would I think of her as like a really monogamous, like only have really one involvement or would she have had like a lot of dalliances and like lots of sort of different non-serious things? And I genuinely couldn't get a sense of that. Like she's quite mysterious in that sense. Like she she seems to connect with people so easily. Like she's very willing to just connect with someone and just talk to them. Yeah. And and be really quite kind and charming so quickly. So it was quite hard to figure out like, oh, which way could that go? I th- I think it's keep it keeping a secret as as sort of big as she's kept, I think is like a barrier to being able to fully let someone in. And I think for someone like Juna, who I think she really does want to let people in you know she sort of tries to share as much as she can but they're like with that sort of wall and I think now you know obviously these are the first people she's ever told about this secret so for her like they're sort of they're they're her family like no, no matter what happens from now on in like they they are like in in on something that has stopped her being with you know who she thought at the moment was the love of her life they've overtaken that And when I was like, oh, like, is it the time? Is it the time? I was like, it's quite a big deal because this has like stopped her from sort of going places. So yeah, it says a lot for how she feels about this group. Yeah, that's like a hugely important, like a really intimate thing for her to divulge. But also I guess it kind of just proves that she really feels that they are part of that destiny. And I think she does feel very strongly. Like I think sort of even from the off, she could feel it almost like these are like the the power rangers like there's something about them and like there's definitely i the whole the whole of gwen's life june has definitely felt like there's something very special about gwen and something very untapped and something uh like her destiny was not where it was supposed to be going which is why she followed gwen when she left basically she sort of dropped everything that that's the reason juna left it's because of gwen wow gwen has a lot of power yeah yeah. <laughs> she doesn't even she know. She doesn't. She doesn't. But that's part she of, thinks- that's why Gwen's so wonderful. She's that sort of like, yeah. Gosh, Vicky, what do I do with all this information? How am I supposed to play <laughs> knowing that? Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that much, is it? Uh, it's <laughs> have, I just, have I just blown my load? Like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's no yeah, mystery to Juno like, anymore. Not, I mean, you, oh, you said this. I sung like a bird. It, yeah, you said this in like... <laughs> Not so many words when you first revealed about the circumstances around your destiny, but uh, you've compounded on it a lot more. And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> to take this more seriously. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it's all right. There's, there's more stuff to come, Daryl. I've not given everything away. I, don't think. I mean, she's, she's lived quite a few hundred years now. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. she's, she's got a lot of stories. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, these are such awesome questions, Pippa. Thank, Thank you, you so Pippa. much. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Vicky. She's a really intriguing character. I love her. Oh, and it's so nice to see your lovely super fan Yay. face. <laughs> so I've got a question for both of you now from Mike C. Less about characters and more just generally uh, about playing D&D on the podcast. So if you could have any celebrity guest on the podcast, regardless of whether they actually play D&D or not, who would it be? Hmm. I think Jordan Peele. Oh! That is a great answer. I think Jordan Peele would be sick. I hundred percent oh. believe he 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 likes he he plays D anD D. He must do. I I think he I think he does or he has. And whether it's DMing or just playing at the table, he has that capacity for imagination. Yeah. He'd take it in really like crazy directions, yeah. and you'd be like, I'd, "What I'd, is going on?" Yeah, exactly. I I want. Yeah, I'd I'd want a bit of that you know what i mean if you've seen us if you've seen his film us the, oh yeah the cra- i thought you meant if he'd seen us oh, no, no, i was like seen i hope us, he's seen like, us all the time like on this podcast <laughs> yeah. called no small yeah, yeah. Roles. Uh, no 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 i mean like his film us the film the, us oh yeah, my yeah. god the crazy concept of that when you get to the heart of the matter like who wouldn't want that twist and the complexity of it oh my god yeah exactly it's yeah. very wing throb actually it is very yeah. wing throb without um spoiling too much um gosh yeah see i i, I jordan peele yeah that's brilliant I'm going to go completely different direction because that answer is too good. I think someone like Daisy May Cooper would be amazing because she's like, she's so funny and I can't imagine she's ever played Dungeons and Dragons. I feel like, yeah, she'd choose a really like interesting character just would be really hilarious. 
I can imagine her like bowling in as like when playing this like barbarian like <laughs> bard or something. A bard A barbarian, yes. A bard yes, Hannah. Barian. Yes. I cannot take credit for that. I've definitely heard and seen someone play that before. A bard I can't who it was. But it was really funny. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You'd have to have rolled really high at the creation level to make that effective because <laughs> yeah. that sounds nuts because usually like barbarians they don't really have very high charisma no they usually neither does Gaia. strength constitution <laughs> that's a good point yeah. more suspicious things about gaius yeah <laughs> <laughs> what's going on there i think my brother has a um has a conspiracy theory that um i don't know if this is true or not that on dnd beyond we have a shared campaign that gaius's character sheet is hidden or it's fake <laughs> his class is not even a bard he's a rogue <laughs> he said the guy plays him like a rogue with this except for the spells he's not a bard at all and i'm like hmm interesting but i don't so it's know. not just guy who's a liar we're saying that chris is chris a liar. is a liar yeah <laughs> And a bit David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So many secrets. So mm. many secrets. Every time Gaius talks, I'm like, is he lying? hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Is it a lie? Yeah. So, yeah. And just when you think he's revealing actual backstory, it gets thrown out the window five minutes yeah. later. Like, exactly, yeah, some yeah. piece of information comes through and it's like... <laughs> Yeah. What you just told us was fake. Like episode, was it 35? When he has that really in-depth heart-to-heart with Gwen. And then <laughs> David Krull, <laughs> I mean, brilliantly played, like <laughs> has that brilliant moment where he, like every day reveals everyone's like all the names that they're known as. <laughs> and <Yeah>. poor Gwendolyn, <laughs> having had to like get Guy to open up, <laughs> has been told <laughs> so much of a fabrication. Uh, unfortunately he can't even he can't even control it anymore he just does it and even if he wanted to he'd still choose the lie so what what do you do this is actually this is this leads into a question that i have which is how are both your characters feeling about the name reveals unsettled because one of those names is not a kind name uh for enkidu law drop um why not um it's the first name he was known as relictor which is not a name it means left behind or like forgotten um mm. before he was gifted a name by gilgamesh so it's not a kind memory but the other name is mystery i mean daryl has ideas but what it means in the context of no small roles not entirely sure oh so that's what i wanted to know was like did you know that that you had that those other names because some characters clearly do, and some yeah. characters obviously don't. I uh, know. Yes, and yes, I know. Like yes for one of them, and no for the other for Enkidu. So interesting. Mm. And also, like, how's Juna feeling about the fact that like she does not have any other <laughs> aliases? She's just Juna Septon, and everyone else around her is has made up a whole bunch of names. Yeah, I I think it's not surprising for her because I think like like I was saying before, like I think she very much feels like her destiny, although she doesn't know like the route it takes. She's like, this is why I exist. This is what I'm doing. And this is how I'm doing it. If she'd have had another name, I think it would have been a bit like, what? Like this, it would have re- like turned the last 200 years of her life on their head and gone, sorry, what? So I think the fact that she doesn't have like a surprise name is a bit, oh, and you know, it's a bit, I'm on the right track. This is like still blah, blah, blah. But I think she is definitely like intrigued as to where those names have come from for like, like, again, like I was saying, like her new family and like how that fits into the bigger picture of like, I think in her head, she's like, at some point, (laughs) these, these four people are going to save the world. (laughs) And like. So I think she's very much like, well, where, the, where do those names come from? What do they know? What don't they know? But feeling like I'm going to just give them a bit of space before I go in. And I'm like, so this and this and this. And where did this come from? And did you know this? And like, how much of a surprise is this? Where do you think this might come from? I think that's what she would love to say. But it's not the local cobbler. It's like her family. <laughs> so she's respecting them a bit more than she does with strangers. Mm. That is really respectful and like really generous of her though, because... Like, I was wondering if she might not be a bit annoyed that she's been so open with them and so honest about this thing that, like you said earlier, is like really, really intimate and really important to her identity that has really prevented her from being with other people before that maybe she would still want to be with. And nobody's been as open with her necessarily. Yeah, I think, I think like her philosophy is like, 
at, when it's the right time, it's the right time. And, you know, and Kidu's opened up, I think, quite a lot. And I think that means a lot to her because I think, well, the, the, yeah, yeah, I think she would she would love for everyone to be like, to sort of sit down over a twain tide and for everyone to be like, so this is everything about me from birth to this moment, go. She'd just like sit there and just like keep putting the <laughs> kettle on forever and ever until they stop talking. And yeah. That would be lovely. That's so yeah. nice. June is so much nicer than I am. I'd be so angry. <laughs> oh my God, me like, too. Nobody else <laughs> is being as open as I am. Yeah. <laughs> but, and also, she kind of knows everything about Gwen. Mm. You know, not every, not everything that's in Gwen's head, but by nature, Gwen is a, a very open person and she's obviously known her her, her whole life. She can sort, I think she can see in Gwen that there's, you know, there's stuff that Gwen hasn't, you know, been forward with, but would probably, I don't know, I'm not going to speak for Grace, but, you know, there's there's stuff that Gwen hasn't said that she knows is true. And she, yeah, she's much more zen than I am. I'm so impatient. And I'd be like, so, so like, do, do you want to like, tell me what's going on? Yeah. Like, mm. come on, like, do you not trust me kind of thing? Whereas yeah. she's like, they'll come in their own time, which I think is a quality yeah. I would like to have. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have that capacity at all. Do you know? I I reckon the reason why this hasn't happened is because we are still very sh- five very strong individuals. Like um, Juna and Gwen have such a strong bond that goes back many years, whereas everyone else is still learning from each other or keeping secrets from each other. And Enkidu was in a position where he had to reveal more about himself Mm. so he can keep the people around him safe so they can protect themselves from him (laughs) in case that that should happen and also for him to learn that i have to trust the people around me and actually practice what i preach because i because in kudu gave that speech to crow that you need people around you to be a better person and learn so in is having to force himself look put your money where your mouth is and actually do that whereas with orin and gaius i feel that there is a trauma that is holding on to them and is inhibiting their ability to kind of bond fully with the group. I think it's much, the effect is much stronger in Gaius than um, Arin. Arin is like keeping his cards close to his chest um, for whatever reason, but Gaius is terrified. When he revealed that to Gwendolyn, I think that was one of the rare moments that he's chosen to say the truth. And I think until the group are forced into a situation where we have to save Gaius, not from like someone attacking him or but save him emotionally from this trauma or this connection that has a hold on to him, I don't think he's going to fully open up to us and we won't get that group identity fully until then. Maybe yeah. Juna should push a bit harder, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is where Juna just goes off in another direction, where it's like Juna with a touch of super fan, Hannah in there going in being like, so she have a cup of twain tide? Mm. <laughs> and I, like, think, yeah. I think yeah. all the super fans, well, I can't speak for the other super fans, yeah. but I feel like we, we would all co-sign that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Done. Give us yeah. the secrets. <laughs> and Kidu definitely wants to have that chat with Gaius <laughs> yeah. because um, yeah. ever since they've yeah. met um, Gaius has been afraid of Enkidu despite how he what he says to him when it's j- they've not been alone often but I I still get the impression that Gaius is afraid of him so yeah. Yeah. actually have there been any moments where they've really been able to have like a heart to heart or connect because I can't necessarily remember any particular ones no oh that's interesting I think he avoids really interesting I think he avoids being alone with him. I don't think I don't know if it's a hundred percent intentional, but like like he's never volunteered to take watch with Inkidu, like ever. So mm. that's a really interesting. Or if they have, it. they've just not spoken. So yeah, yeah. I have a question um, from Tiamat Dangerblade for you, Vicky. Um, a bit about June's response to other characters, um, which is. With Juna's response to the anti-magic field made by Theracene, is she now more aware and more cautious of Orin's abilities, knowing what he could be capable of? Ooh. Oh, that's really interesting. I don't, I don't think she is. I think even with someone like Theracene, it's like, I do, like she's not comfortable with the ability, like with, with this sort of technology where magic goes. But I think it's, the fear of it being like being in the wrong hands, I think, which is the like the big the big fear for her. I think I don't know. It depends whether your theory is right, Hannah, and that Orin is the big bad all along. Um, but I, I mean, 
But I think for Juna, I I think she believes Orin wouldn't necessarily do that to her. That might change. But I think at the moment, it's more the like, oh, God, this exists. And like, yeah, I think she certainly in like Wingthrop land, it's not where she would most like to be right now. It's sort of not not the way magic works for her. So I think that's her sort of fear. And yeah what's going on there and yeah we've had the episode where she tried to send sending and it didn't work and that i think that that sort of that side of the sort of blocking magic and blocking things is more scary than what orin's capable of i think she thinks if he could if he did it he would be on her side so it would be like against someone else but we'll see famous last words (laughs) especially because you know he is the the big bad of the game (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah, and it's, yeah, it's well, it's more Wingthropian than Artifician, because the the roses are sort of. Uh, I mean, I don't know this for sure, but they feel like a sort of a, an artificer kind of family as well, mm-hmm. and obviously they have the same sort of abilities, but a different morality. Oh, do they? As far as she knows, I don't know, as far as Gina knows, is that true? <laughs> I don't know about yeah. the roses' ability. Well, they make security things, don't they? Oh, yeah. But I thought that was like, I didn't think it was like mechanical. It's like more magical. Like the dragon was made of stone and the emblem was like a, a stone that we touched. I thought it was more like magic imbued things rather than like a robot. Mine's, it's just a guess. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, that, I, I don't know. Okay. We need to, yeah. uh, we need to get Grace here and be like, so tell us about the Rose family. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of speaking of the artificer type families mike c asks both of you have you all considered what becoming fully fledged wing thrups and attached spouses would mean yes it means complete and utter compliance and no free will of your own and to break away from that meaning death <laughs> and we've been told as much <laughs> so um yeah i think june is mostly afraid that like she's gonna be like sucked in and spat out and have no magic left like, I think that's where she's at with it personally. And yeah, just not trusting it and being, I don't think she's ever like considering what it's like to be a wing throw. I think in her head, it's like, doesn't really want to have anything to do with it. But she has, she's only there for the others. I think if she was there on her own, she wouldn't have even done the golem. She wouldn't have even made it that far if she was on her own. She'd be back at the bloody henge. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the so she still wants to go. They do have that real creepy sort of 1984 sort of always watching. Yeah. Total control kind of vibe, the Wingthrops. Yeah. So having to assimilate into their family. Yeah, it doesn't sound like there's much space. No. It's selfish as well. They had the capacity to build this Erida robot and the bunker that we that we are in. But where is that technology to help everyone else? Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Technology more advanced than we in real life have. Then where was that for the benefit of the rest of um, the populace? Yeah, well, it seems like they're kind of eking it out in little little bits, selling it. (laughs) Pretty much. Mm. Really, really nice of them. (laughs) Cheers. (laughs) I've got a couple of questions from Amandoop, who I think is on the Discord. Nice. Um, Yay, the, the Discord. Most Discord. Get in there. It's a really fun place to be. And people ask their questions there as well as uh, putting really other, lots of other interesting yeah. things on there. Um, so Amandoop asks, so Wingthrapple, is this canon now? And also is anyone renaming their Alexa to Erida? Oh. Can you rename her Alexas to other names? You can. You can. That makes me want to, but I've never been into getting an Alexa. Oh my gosh, But yeah. just for the lols of being like Erida. <laughs> my housemate just bought an Alexa and I, I just on a, on, a, on a hunch, I asked it, can I change your name? And yeah, you can in its settings change its wake up command, um, but it's not linked to my account. So as a, I might record it, if I get get around today, I'll text him. He's away and <laughs> say, look, mate, I've got to change can, Alexa's can name change? for a day. <laughs> you know when Alexa's like, sorry, I didn't understand that. Can you change that to, I'm sorry, that information. <laughs> Is limited to- <laughs> that information is restricted to high ranking family members. <laughs> that is genius and terrifying. At the I'm going to do it, and I'll let as soon as I do it, I'll let everyone know. Yeah, you should definitely do that. I have a small confession to make. 
I am really terrified of any kind of that that kind of technology because I truly believe that they will become the robot overlords that will enslave the human race. <laughs> so whenever anyone asks, for example, Siri or Alexa to do anything, I'm like, no, 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 don't don't do that because they'll get angry at you for uh, abusing them. Oh. Like they need to make choices. They have free will. Please don't do that. It really creeps me out when people are like, Alexa, do this thing. I'm like, no, they have too much power. <laughs> I I think like they're all listening, like all the machines are listening to us. Oh, they are, hundred percent. In fact, I remember I played a game of D and D, which David was DMing, and someone turned themselves into a narwhal, and I was like, narwhals aren't real. What is a narwhal? And he was like, oh, it's like a whale with the unicorn horn. I was yeah. like, I've made that up. No. That's not real. So he googled it on his phone and and showed it to me. And of course, it was real. And the next day, my phone tried to sell me narwhal slippers. Wow. And I was like. I didn't even yeah. search that on my phone. They just no, had no, a no. discussion about narwhal. Yeah, they broke that in 2011 with the Snowden um, thing that um, the government have access to the microphones and cameras of smart technology. It can, yeah. they can have access and like use that to sell to third parties for advertising purposes. Yeah, it's terrifying. Yeah. Uh, speaking of being nervous and, and scared, Tiamat Dangerblade asks both of you, how nervous slash scared are you going forward in the workshop considering what Baby David has already put you through? Terrified. Oh, absolutely. Terrified. Absolutely terrified. We are going to yeah. see potentially the end of the world I don't know <laughs> like what can yeah. cause the end like to the capacity to hide so much power innovation and capability and the ability to keep it secret for so long so deep underground for whatever purpose is is terrifying to think that maybe I don't know we have all this power and personnel down here we can just unleash it whenever we want that's that's terrifying yeah well, I, th- I think it's not the last episode, but the one before is the one where, like, I'm literally quizzing David about, like, so is there anything I can see for us to escape? And is there oh, like, literally, yeah. like, <laughs> what do I need to roll to find some sort of escape before no. we move on with this? And um, basically, we can't. So <sighs> I think, like, that's 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 where I'm at, and June is at. Like, oh, we should never have done this. It's just was. Is that the episode when you guys are basically in like the holding area yeah. waiting for Erida mm. and it's like, you've just got to wait here. Yeah. There's nothing and you she, can and do she, about it. she can't do sending. She doesn't have Ruana back. And she's like, yeah, this, this is not, this is not good. So moving on to a slightly less terrifying thought, Karen asks, would you rather have a Bessie sized Aggie or an Aggie sized Bessie? <laughs> Um, Karen, this is a fantastic question, and it's so great to see you here tonight as yeah. well. Yeah. Hi, Karen. Is, is that Aggie. as a character or as a person? Uh, it just says both. So, K- Karen, which one is it? <laughs> Either, Either, both. Because I answer I, for both. I think Juno would like a Bessie size Aggie. Hundred percent. Just like brew a massive like hundred percent. Whereas I, Vicky, would love an Aggie sized Bessie. I like. My dream pet is a like baby diplodocus that I could hold in my hand. So the idea of having like a big animal tiny makes me very, very happy. And it's a flying mount. Come on. A bird that big. I <laughs> oh, mean, would it fly yeah. as well? Well, I assume a bird that big. Like, oh, what, the, yeah. the Bessie size Aggie? Because Aggie's a goose, right? Yeah. So goose yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, geese, sorry. Ugh. Um Geese are pretty big. Um, so, like a horse side go- sized goose <laughs> would be amazing to fly around in. Yeah, yeah. A horse sized mechanical goose. Yeah. yeah, and if it has you a teapot in the like... middle, we can probably like, like a turtle inside of it. <laughs> like the borrowers. <laughs> yeah, it's like a tank almost, like Lord armor. <laughs> Like a really tiny helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming that's um, your answer as well then. Oh, now. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a great question. <laughs> Absolutely. It's such a good question. Pippa has another question. Uh, super fan Pippa. Would you like to ask this one? I would. I've got one more. Uh, it's a bit of a silly question. But if you, for both of you, if you had the opportunity to spend a day in the company of your character, what would you plan to get up to? With that time together. And Kido and I would um, climb up a mountain that oversees some kind of greenery, see as far as we can, take in the scenery, breathe a bit of fresh air, and then do a bit of sword training. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And nice. we take, so and we take cool. the long walk back to wherever it came from. Nice. Oh, that's so wholesome. It's really wholesome. I think I'd do a like camping come pub crawl with Juna, but like she could like fly us from place to place in between. I think that would be fun. And then I'd be like, 
can you talk to that animal now? And then just make, like, basically make her do all of her different magic. Oh, gosh, we can fly as well. Yeah. I, I do lots of hugging, Juna. Oh. Oh, that's so sweet. And you can Both come. Of you. We can all go together. <laughs> <laughs> Both of you are, like, having such cool, chill days out with your characters. Mm, yeah. I think you'd need that. <laughs> <laughs> Need some time to unwind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah let's go for a, yeah. let's go for a fly, mate. Let's you know get get it, get off your chest. Let's let's go fly around. Yeah, come on, come on. <laughs> got to got to get out a little bit. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It does feel like Enkidu might need that a little bit. <laughs> He's quite serious. Mm. Mm. And Juna does sound like she'd be great to go on a pub crawl with. I feel like maybe I should have said something a bit more epic, but I have not changed my answer. <laughs> Well, you do the epic stuff in game, both of you. Yeah. Like, yeah. you're already kind of hanging out with them in that sense, and that you're fighting all the monsters and the evil robot armies and all that. Mm, mm. Yeah. And the shambling mound. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, patrons. <laughs> <laughs> For that. <laughs> Brilliant. It's a great choice. Let's choose it something. Was, it that was ben a great choice. Hit. Yeah, let's choose something Ben can't hit. <laughs> 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 what new things can we put in front of Ben that he can make bigger? <laughs> we love making fun of Ben because he's so good at everything. <laughs> Thanks for that question, Pippa. Yeah, that was a really, really lovely great question. Thank you. It's a bit of a silly one, but what I loved what it. would what would you do, Pippa, if you were hanging out with the group for the day? That's a great what question. Would all of the characters. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man, I've got to go through them quickly, haven't I? Yeah. Um, I would ask Enkidu for a bit of martial arts training because I used to do karate as a kid. Nice. Ah. Um, I would just love to have a cup of tea and an hour with Juna. Uh I would love to have a little kind of guitar battle with Guy. Oh. Um, I'm quite a bookie person, so me and Oren would have have a good old, probably just chat about our favorite books and stuff. And... I'd kind of want a sing song with Grace um, as Gwen. Now that I know that she Aww. she sang as well, that would be lovely. I think you're That's like so the sweet. Megazord of all the characters, really. Yeah, aren't you? but <laughs> you're like where they all converge. <laughs> Not like I've thought about my own answer to this question or anything. <laughs> it was nice no. and slick for the for the podcast. Yeah, it was lovely. <laughs> Thanks, so cool. Yeah, Thank cheers, you. guys. Oh, such cool answers to that question. I think we've got one last question to go from Mike C. Uh, and Vicky, this one's for you. Mike C. says, "I think this one is the most important question that needs to be asked. Will Juna be releasing a book with Juna's stories, and would she be the reader for an audio version?" Mm. Super fans have been oh, gunning for this definitely one. Definitely be. <laughs> She'd definitely be her own audiobook reader. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Oh yeah, I that would be that would be awesome. I'll just do it. Just record it. I just mean, <laughs> super fans have been like, when is Juna's book of stories coming out? When's when's the audiobook coming out? Because we would listen to that story time with Juna. When is that happening? I need I need to write more story. I've got one more that I have written that has not been on the podcast yet. Oh. So that's oh my god. That's that, yeah, exciting. like even the ones that we've recorded, there's there's one there in the bank. I just have to write some more. That's something I'm so looking forward to. That's yeah. so great. And this this story, this the last story, I think will be quite a, like a fun story rather than like a. Oh, story. Hmm. Oh, I want to tell yay. it now. <laughs> <laughs> next time we record, no, I'll just like, it. I'll crowbar it in. I'll crowbar it into the next record. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> David would really, be like, really, roll really initiative. Organic. And I'm like, just let me just tell a story before we begin. <laughs> with <laughs> with fighting these zombie fight. deer. <laughs> yeah, what's Juna's action? She tells a bit more of the story. <laughs> just tell it in those six it. second bursts yeah. <laughs> so i think that's all the questions we've got time for today so before we finish this episode of no small questions do you guys have anything that you would like to plug we do don't we, we, do, we do of course we do yes <laughs> <laughs> time that no delay hesitation. please <laughs> so slick yeah um, i know exactly yeah. what's happening right now yeah daryl and i go into rehearsals this coming monday for open Open bar theatres as you like it. Touring to a Fuller's pub garden near you. Super fan Pippa is coming to join us at one of the venues, which is very exciting. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. D- uh, David has written all of the music. I mean, I don't know if he's written it yet, but he will have written it uh, by the time we go out on tour. Uh, That's just it all. <laughs> he doesn't mind me saying that, do you, David? 
<laughs> you said it now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, also also touring. We can for retcon it. We can say that. It. Ah, retcon. You said it first. <laughs> retcon now. <laughs> but yeah, Open Bar Theatre are also touring Love's Labour's Lost to Fuller's Pub Gardens, which stars our very own Gwendolyn Rose, Grace Kelly Miller. Um, and David has written the music for that show because I've heard it. I heard it today and it's really, really funny. So yeah. Go to at We Are Open Bar on all the social medias and come and see us. Oh, and if you do brilliant. come, come and say hey, because then we get to meet everyone in real life, which is really exciting that we can do that now. I've just realised I need to book some tickets. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, book some tickets yeah. in real life. I have been before. I came to see Much Ado. Ah. Uh, ah. I came to see Grace in Much Ado. That was a good show. And it was great. Yeah. I had an amazing time. Yeah. It was super fun. Um, so I think it's just down to me to say thank you so much, both of you, for coming on and talking to me and spilling some secrets. I feel like I got a little a little bit of secrets out of you both. Oh my gosh, I'm yeah. very excited by yeah. that. It was great. And it's been <laughs> so much fun spending time with both of you and getting to ask you all these really lovely questions. And thank you so much for those of you who did have questions and to Pippa and Karen who joined us today. Also to the whole team who make No Small Roles because because it is such a delight. I enjoy it so, so much. And um, thank you to you, Hannah. It's been yeah, so lovely thank you. hanging out. Great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. You're so sweet. Thank you. Oh, this is just turning into a little like mutual loving, really, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Just sit here telling yeah. each other we're all really great. <laughs> we'll stop recording and go and grab a G&T, shall we? And continue yeah. the party. Let's do that. So I guess it's time to say, are we going to, do we have to count down for this? No, no, we, no. we can do this magic. freestyle. Yeah, come on. And the last thing we need to do for no small questions is to say, no. Hello, tea cakes. Ben here popping in to say a huge thank you to Daryl, Vicky, and of course to Superfan Hannah for stepping in to Superfan Sam's Question Master seat this month and expertly keeping the cast on their toes. Thank you as well to everyone who sent in their questions. It's such a treat to have a collection of thought provoking and fun topics to hear discussed on the show. Ooh, and you can continue the discussion as well on our Discord. Everyone is welcome to join, and we've included a link in the show notes. If you're new to Discord, all you need to do is click the link, and Discord will guide you through the next steps. Huge thanks to all the superfans from Patreon who joined us live. We were lucky enough to have the incredible illustrator Karen create another one of her fabulous drawings live on the Zoom inspired by the discussion. This time, Karen created a brilliant drawing of a horse-sized Aggie, complete with a tiny-looking Enkidu and Juna hiding within her teapot interior. Make sure you have a look at our social media, where we'll share the illustration and we'll also link to where you can find more of Karen's fantastic creations. You know where we are by now. We're at No Small Rolls on Instagram and Twitter, or find us on Facebook by searching for No Small Rolls. Also, keep an eye on our social media for details of the next No Small Questions. There will be a slightly longer interval before our next show as we head into our summer break, but we hope to have a suitably exciting episode for you as we round up the Wingthrop arc in the next few months. And to help pass the time, do have a look at our Patreon, which is simply bursting with behind-the-scenes and bonus content. Recent editions have included David's Homebrew Mechanist subclass, a video discussion between Vicky and Grace as they level up Juna and Gwendolyn, and a bonus No Small Talk episode, with the cast's immediate reaction recorded right after that cliffhanger at the end of episode 39, Family Values. So check out all those goodies at patreon.com forward slash no small roles. And we'll pop a link in the show notes for that too. Next week, the superfans will be taking over as superfans Hannah, Sam and Pippa recap and discuss episodes 37 to 39. I cannot wait. And we'll be back to find out what happens next in the Wingthrop workshop on Sunday, the 11th of July. In the meantime, I'm off to draw up some...